And so I hope that you will give me five or six minutes of your time um, as we get into the Word of God today. Is that all right? Amen, amen. Now the sermon topic is entitled The Cupbearer. The Cupbearer. And we're taken, the scripture reading is taken from Mark chapter 14 and verses. Oh my, oh my, oh my. All right, we're there, 35 and 36. Mark chapter 14, verses 35 and 36. The Bible says, He went a little farther and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this what? Cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. The cupbearer. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord, to speak a word today. Lord, it is communion service, and may we all turn to you as Lord, Savior, and King of our life. Lord, use this lump of clay once again to speak your words. And today, O oh God, may we be drawn closer to you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. I don't know about you, but I, when I was a little child, I had um, a favorite cup. Maybe for you it may have been a favorite plate, a favorite dish of some kind. But for me, it was a favorite cup. I love that cup. In fact, elder gentles, I still have that cup to this very day. Um, it, it's not the typical little boy's cup. In fact, the inside of it is pink. But I love that cup so much uh, because it was my cup. Nobody else could use my cup. Uh, it had what I felt a special sense of belonging for me because, because it belonged to me. Uh, no one else could come to my house. We could have visitors, we could have guests, but they could not drink from my cup. Now I'm not like that today. You come in my house, you can use anything. You can even use my house if you like. But for me, that was very special because it was mine. Jesus, at the close of his ministry on earth, is meeting with the disciples at the Last Supper, and there he presents this whole idea about a cup. And there in the communion service, as it may, he presents that they must drink from the cup. Now, what is very important about this is that he poured wine into the cup and he blessed it. Now, it wasn't fermented wine. It was unfermented. We know that because it was the fruit of the vine. And he wouldn't go back in the Bible and change his mind on something when he said in the Old Testament that it's wrong. Then all of a sudden in the New Testament, he's going to say, well, drink all of it. No, it doesn't happen like that. So it was unfermented. He put it into the cup. He drank it and he gave it to his disciples. He blessed it. He gave it to his disciples and they also drank from the cup and ate the bread. Now, after all of that, he goes into the Garden of Gethsemane where our text is found and he is there and again he prays about this cup. What is the matter with Jesus when he presents over and over again, even in the communion service, about this cup? Now I got interested on that and I started to do a little bit of research regarding the cup in the Bible. What I found is that, is that the whole reference to the cup in the Bible is held uh, 32 times. There's references or stories in the Bible that deals with the cup. In fact, one of the most well-known passages or psalms in the Bible is Psalm 23. And one of those, those, those verses says, He anoints my head with oil, my what? Cup runneth over it. So this, of course, to, to, to not stretch out the message, it denotes that there is a blessing upon an individual when you serve God. That your cup is going to flow over, that you will have an abundance, that, that you will not be able to contain it. So, so when you hear about the cup in the Bible, it talks about the blessings of God. But then there's also another, another uh, idea that comes up from the cup. Here you find in Matthew chapter 20 and verses 22 and 23, the mother of James and John, you know it's hard when a mother comes to you, the mother comes to, to Jesus and says, with a request, she says, Can I have my sons sit at your, 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 your right hand when you get into your kingdom? And Jesus then, uh, then answers them in Matthew chapter 20 and verses 22, You do not know what you ask. Are you, James and John, able to drink the cup that I am able to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said unto him, We are able. Again, Jesus brings up the whole idea about this cup. 
they answer affirmatively before they realize what the cup actually contains. And in verse 23, Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my father. James, the son of Zebedee, was the first one to be killed in Acts. He did not know what he was asking for. Be careful what you ask God for. John was the one who lived, they say, uh, uh, nearly 100 years. But he suffered greatly, and even tradition has it that he was put into boiling hot oil and then sent, banished on the island of Patmos. He did not understand what he was asking for when he said he could drink from the cup that Jesus was drinking from. That cup, my friends, was also the cup of suffering. So it was not only about blessing when you hear about the cup, but it's the cup of suffering. Now, now, there is a little bit more. So the cup entails that there is blessing, there is suffering. And then we go on, when we drink of his cup, when we come to the table like we are today, we are also saying that we're willing to suffer like Christ suffered. I wondered how many of us want to be humiliated. I wonder how many of us actually want to suffer in this life. In a day and age when you hear all of these individuals, all of these preachers out there giving you a prosperity gospel and yet you find here Jesus saying, are you going to drink this cup? If you drink this cup, this cup is a cup of suffering. And yet we're told, no, 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 just reach up and grab it. Reach up and claim it. You name it and you claim it and it's yours. You can have a big house. You can have an expensive car. Just reach up and, and tell genie God what you want. When Jesus himself says, if you drink from this cup, you indeed are going to suffer like I suffered. Some things are going to happen in your life that you never anticipated. Some problems are going to exist that you never really even dreamed about. But guess what? In the moments of time, even when you go through the suffering, remember that there is a blessing that comes out of the suffering, just like Jesus did. Because he went straight to the cross, and because of that, we can be forgiven of our sin. Amen. When we drink this cup today, we know that there is symbolism attached to it because we are also partaking in the suffering of Christ and the blessing that comes from drinking the cup. Now, I got a little bit interested in the whole idea of the cup, as I said, and I researched this thing, and let me see if I can encapsulate that in about two minutes. Um, this whole idea about the cupbearer. Now, now the cup, the theme of the cup actually starts out from Genesis and goes all the way to Revelation. You knew that. So in Genesis, you find the story of Joseph. And Joseph comes about, and you see now he is in prison. He's, 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 he's stabbed in the back, if you may, by his brothers, and he gets thrown in prison, and he meets a, a butler and a baker. And now the whole idea about a cup comes into play because you know, or the cupbearer, because the butler was the cupbearer to the king. And so this man now, you find out that his role was to taste, to taste what the king, before the king actually drank something, the cupbearer would come and take that thing and drink it. And if it was poison, the cupbearer's life would be taken at that very moment. Now, now, later on, you find the whole idea of cup actually developing in the story of Joseph because at the very end, when he, when he now, his brothers who are hungry, they're down and out, there's a role reversal, the enemies now who got him in trouble, now everything has turned on them, they come to him, they don't even know it's him, and now they're about to leave to go back into their land after they received all of the goods, and guess what happens? There is a cup in somebody's bag. And, and so we find here that he goes, and even this idea that there is guilt, there is guilt because the past sin has come home to roost, but you find the cup still very present there that shows it's a symbol of repentance or forgiveness because here now he's working on them to bring them back, to allow for them to now be revealed and to say, you know what, in spite of your problems, here I'm able to forgive you. And they came back expecting that they, they cared about Benjamin so much now that they came back and now to free their brother. And he says, look, you are repentant of your sin. Something has changed, but it was the cup that was there that brought them back. 
In the same way, when we come to the communion table, it's the cup that shows us not only the blessing of Christ, not only the suffering that we partake on, but also it's a symbol of forgiveness that shows us that when we come and we taste of that cup, my friends, the cup bearer has suffered the penalty of drinking the poison that we should have been drinking. I don't know if my mic just went off. Did my mic just go off? At that very moment, we see the whole theme of the cup developing. But not only that, I'm getting excited now, and I know I told you two minutes. But, 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 but the truth is that you see the whole idea of the cup developing when you get into, into the place where, where Nebuchadnezzar, who took the people of God captive, you know that, he took them captive and brought them into Babylon into a bad place and they were there for a long time and then Belshazzar comes on the scene and he decides that I'm now king I will never be toppled my kingdom shall reign forever and even though he knew that something was definitely wrong and he decides now to take himself and throw a party in one night and, and, and Daniel chapter 5 you find where this party is going on and Belshazzar is having the time of his life and the Bible says that he does something he allows for them to go and get the vessels including the cup and we know it's the cup because because he took the cup that's supposed to be in the sanctuary service that was supposed to be a symbol of forgiveness for the people's sins and he took that cup and filled it to, with, with his own wine to drink from it it is then that judgment was issued upon his household and in that very moment, the Bible tells us that a hand appeared from right behind him and started to inscribe on the wall behind him, many, many tekel uparsin, you are weighed in the balance and you have found light. And it's that very moment that he didn't realize that judgment was now upon him because he drank and defaced the cup. And the truth is, how does that apply to our very lives? Because when we come to the table, we have to realize that we must also be cleansed. We can't present to God any old way and think that he should just accept us and think we can defile the cup that he presents. But you find now, the whole idea about the cup bearer, and I've got to finish here, but the whole idea about the cup bearer is that you find Jesus coming onto the scene. He knows fully well. He talks about this cup. They let this cup pass from me. If it is possible, let this cup, this cup, drink from this cup. And it's, it appears that Jesus knows that this cup that he's drinking, which is referred to in the, in, the, in the New Testament, in Revelation, as the wrath of God, he partakes of that cup. He struggles with it because it's the cup of sin. He partakes of that thing and he drinks it knowing that it's poison so that we would not have to drink it and go free. That's the beauty that we find. My friends, but not only that, we find a beautiful story that comes out from the Hebrew, Hebrew nation. And so they, they say that it's a picture of, uh, of, of when someone is, is going to get engaged. So you have this young man, for sake. Uh, if you could start playing for me, if someone could just start playing for me, I'm about to close. Uh, if, when, when you have someone who's about to get married, uh, and, and, and Chris Doy, that young man sees that young lady and he, he loves that young lady dearly. There is something very special that he does. He takes his cup and he fills it with wine or drink, whatever it may be. And he drinks from it. Then that young lady that he cares for so much, in order for them to be engaged, gives that cup to that young lady. She takes the cup and she also drinks from his cup. By doing so, she is stating that through the good and the bad, that they will forever remain married. That's why it's so hard to get divorced. Because you didn't know what you were signing up for. You can never separate once you drink the cup. You're saying that whatever the suffering, whatever the bad components of that life would bring, whatever the good times it would bring, you're going to partake in that together forever. In the same way, when we come to this table, that's what we're saying. God, I'm going to follow you all the way. In the good times, I'm going to follow you. In the bad times, I'm going to follow you. There are days when you're going to be feeling at the top like you're a Christian who can walk on clouds. And there are days when you're going to feel like you're just dirt and low down, nothing, no good. But at that moment is when you still rely on Jesus knowing that he said, in spite of the suffering, in spite of the pain, you are still mine. 
And that's what we must remember at the communion table. Today, we do offer open communion for those who are Christians of another faith and you want to partake in these emblems today. You want to say, Christ, in spite of the suffering, in spite of the good times, I'm going to serve you. It's about humility. It breaks us down. It's about forgiveness. It's about blessing. It's also about suffering. And Christ was the ultimate cupbearer. And to let us know that we too can partake today and be one with Christ. I'm going to pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, I just want to thank you for your people. I thank you for your words, oh God. I thank you for being the ultimate cupbearer who was able to take care of the sin problem and bring us a special blessing. Today as we go into the feet washing service, may we remember that you offered the ultimate sacrifice for us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We do offer open communion like I said.